Greetings. Uh, this lecture, or this trilogy of lectures, is on the assembly line biosynthesis of a class of antibiotics called the polyketide antibiotics. Before I start, I would like to share with you the motivation for recording a set of lectures that I did in a similar setting uh, more than a decade ago. Uh, there's three things that have changed. The first one is that the field of polyketide antibiotic biosynthesis has moved forward quite a bit over the past decade, and I thought it would be helpful for you to know what has changed. The second one is that the world of science, and biochemistry in particular, in which this topic sits, has moved significantly too. And so it would be helpful for you to place what is new and important in this field in the broader context of biochemistry. And the third one, of course, is I've gotten 10 years older. And while the latter generally leads to more gray hair, in my case considerably more than what was there in the first version that I recorded, it also gives somebody like myself, who's been working on this problem for, the, for more than two decades, a chance to think about where this field is going. And I hope some of the things I share with you today might give, especially the young people in the audience, a chance to think about where the field could be 10 years from now, thanks to your own efforts. OK, so with that as a backdrop, let me start with what you're looking at this picture of an automobile assembly line. You all instant, instantly recognize what you're looking at in this picture. You're looking at Henry Ford's contribution to modern society. And what you're seeing more specifically is an assembly line that builds cars on a series of way stations where at each way station, there are a set of catalysts, human and mechanical, that perform exquisite tasks with a lot of sophistication, but more or less in a manner that is oblivious about what is happening, happening upstream or downstream of their way station. And the genius of Henry Ford lies in the modularity of this device. So the same assembly line that builds a Ford Escort, by changing a few things at the way stations, you could change some of the catalysts that do certain operations at a way station, or you could change the inputs at different points in the way station, by those relatively simple and modular changes, you can change the output, which, would, which in one case could be a, a Ford Escort, in another case might be a Lincoln Town Car, or a, a, your favorite automobile. Now, nature has come up with a very similar strategy to make a class of antibiotics called the polyketide antibiotics. And what I show you in this simple cartoon is a prototypical example of an assembly line that's made up of a bunch of enzymes and is responsible for making a key intermediate in the biosynthesis of the well-known antibiotic erythromycin. This intermediate is called 6-deoxyerythronolide B, and the assembly line that makes 6-deoxyerythronolide B is called the 6-deoxyerythronolide B synthase, or DEBS for short. And DEBS is made up of three very large proteins. You're seeing those three proteins in cartoon forms on this slide. Each protein, you see the first protein made up of two modules, modules one and two, 
and an upstream bit that we call the loading domain, or LD for short. And this protein is a homodimer. You then have a second protein that is also a homodimer and is made up of two more modules of catalysts. And then a final protein that is made up of two additional modules and another catalyst called the TE, or thioesterase for short. So this alpha-2, beta-2, gamma-2 hexamer that makes up this assembly line called DEBS has a molecular mass of roughly a little bit over 2 million Daltons. For those of you who don't know what 2 million Daltons buys you in biochemistry, that's about the size of a ribosome. And so, as a point of curiosity, you may wish to acknowledge that it takes nature a 2 million Dalton machine to make an antibiotic whose job it is to gum up the other 2 million Dalton machine. The rest of my lecture is going to be focused on this assembly line, DEBS. Now, DEBS is an assembly line that uses a bunch of precursors that are available in metabolism. You all are familiar with precursors such as acetyl coenzyme A or malonyl coenzyme A. What you're seeing in this slide are subtle variants of acetyl coenzyme A and malonyl coenzyme A. You're seeing a precursor called propionyl coenzyme A on the far left of this slide. And the central precursor that feeds into each of the modules, six modules of the assembly line, is a variant of malonyl coenzyme A called methylmalonyl coenzyme A. And so nature crafts this product, 6-deoxyerythronolide B, out of one equivalent of propionyl coenzyme A, six equivalents of methylmalonyl coenzyme A, and six equivalents of NADPH, which you all know is a reducing equivalent in biology. And the way these precursors come together to make this molecule 6-deoxyerythronolide B that you're seeing uh, to the far right of this assembly line is by a mechanism where you have propionyl coenzyme A that starts the assembly line, that primes the assembly line, and through incremental addition of precursors, you have at each, each module on the assembly line, you have further elaboration of the precursor to give you a highly complex product at the end called 6-deoxyerythronolide B. And this assembly line was discovered independently by two research groups, one at the University of Cambridge and another at Abbott Laboratories, both who were working on this problem about 25 years ago. Now, just like erythromycin, there are a number of other complex antibiotics that are made by this, uh, by, by, by this assembly line strategy. And you're seeing some of the who's who among antibiotics on this slide, each of which is made by a biosynthetic assembly line that's similar, very similar to the kind that's used to make 6-deoxyerythronolide B. So here's the outline of what I have to say to you today. Uh, I will first, this, this module is going to focus on three general overview topics that I expect should be uh, accessible to anybody who has had or is concurrently taking a basic course in biochemistry. I am going to tell you about the evolutionary biology of these assembly lines. I will then talk a little bit about the chemistry that happens on the DEBS assembly line. 
and then I'll give you an overview of what this assembly line actually looks like so you can put everything else in context. In subsequent modules, we'll talk about the tools the field uses to study these assembly line enzymes and then some properties of these assembly lines that represent cutting edge topics in modern research. So let's start with the biology. Back when we started working on this assembly line, which is way out here, perhaps even before then, there was only one assembly line that was known, DEBS. And so you either worked on DEBS or you did something else. As you can see in this graph, the world has changed significantly over the past 20 years. It had changed some, but not a whole lot around the time I recorded this, the earlier version of these lectures. There were maybe a few tens of these assembly lines that had been painstakingly cloned and sequenced over the first 10 or 20, 10 or 15 years on this slide. And then something happened around the mid-2000s. As I'm sure most of you recognize, that's around the time it became relatively easy to sequence genomes, in particular bacterial genomes. And since then, the field has exploded in terms of the number of assembly lines that are known to us through sequence identity. So, as of last summer, there were close to 1,000 distinct polyketide assembly lines that had been cloned and sequenced and whose sequence had been deposited in the database. Now, what's important to note about this slide is a vast majority of the assembly lines whose sequence is available today are what we call orphan assembly lines. Nobody really knows what these assembly lines are doing in nature. We just know their sequence. And so we know they must be doing something in nature, or they probably are doing something. But a vast majority, about 80% of these assembly lines, are begging for insights. Here is an evolutionary tree. Some of you may recognize it as looking like a dendrogram of about 50 of the known polyketide assembly lines that have been sequenced to date. And I don't expect you to read this slide in detail, but for those of you who have heard about polyketide antibiotics, to the right of this slide, what you're seeing are names like macrolides or macrolide antibiotics, FKBP binding antibiotics like FK506 and rapamycin, polyether antibiotics that are frequently used in veterinary medicine. These are ensomycins, which include rifamycin, the frontline antibiotic to treat tuberculosis. These are all antibiotics that represent the who's who of infectious diseases, cancer, chemotherapy, and related disease states. These are a few examples of polyketide assembly lines whose sequence we know today. But these are only a small fraction of the polyketide assembly lines that we know of, whose existence we know of today. So what you're seeing in, on the far left of this slide is another family tree, another dendrogram that I'm almost certain nobody can read, and I don't expect you to. The point I want to leave you with is that this vast pool of orphan assembly lines represents a really interesting starting point for the field that's, for a field that's looking forward. Because the known polyketide assembly lines today represent only small fractions of this overall dendrogram. They are large swaths of this family tree where we know nothing about what these polyketide synthases are doing. And here's just one interesting factoid. A lot of people who look at this field think, oh, these are antibiotic biosynthetic enzymes. They exist in bacteria. That's true. 
many, perhaps most of these antibiotic assembly lines exist in bacteria, but this arrow down toward the bottom of this slide points to a small clade in this very large assembly line, uh, in this very large collection of orphans that it actually is encoded by a bunch of worms. And if you look a little bit further at some of these assembly lines, they seem to be making some fairly complicated antibiotics. Again, I want to emphasize we don't know what these assembly lines are making for certain, but we can be reasonably confident that these assembly lines are making something very complex, and they probably are doing so for the benefit of the worms that, and we don't understand what or how. So, this field of polyketide biosynthesis, one of the major things that has happened is back when I recorded this in the past, for any one of these assembly lines, if you wanted the genetic information, the blueprint for these assembly lines, that would be close to an entire PhD thesis. Today, you can get thousands of these assembly lines essentially for the price of free. Uh, these exist in the database, and you can do whatever you want. And so there's two major challenges for the field going forward, starting with this embarrassment of riches. The first one is to develop the knowledge that can help us decode what these assembly lines are doing in nature, because that insight might let us exploit the products of these orphan assembly lines for interesting medical and or other applications. The second thing that one could hope the field can deliver over the coming decade is the insights that might allow us to start with these 1,000 or 2,000 assembly lines and scramble them in ways to make molecules that nature probably didn't bother trying out, or maybe nature tried out but didn't find much use for, but humanity could find use for. And that represents another important goal in the field. Okay, so with that as a biological background, let's switch to the chemistry that happens on one of these polyketide assembly lines, namely DEPS. So I introduced you to this assembly line DEBS that makes this intricate molecule to the right called 6-deoxyerythronolide B. Perhaps the best way for me to give you a sense of the actual enzymatic chemistry that's happening on this assembly line is by zeroing in on one of those modules, and I've boxed module 3 for illustration purposes. And let's take a close look at what's happening in module 3, as well as its two interfaces with its neighboring modules, module 2 and module 4, respectively. Because if we can understand what module 3 does in the overall biosynthetic process, how it talks to module 2, and how it hands off its product to module 4, then the rest of this pathway becomes relatively straightforward to understand. So in order to explain to you what module 3 does, we need to go into a higher level of granularity. And this is where I have introduced a few acronyms in the slide. For those of you who are still paying attention, you've started to see in what I had earlier on called modules 2, 3, and 4, the appearance of some acronyms, KS, AT, KR, ACP, and so on. For the initiated, these are the quintessential domains, catalytic domains that one finds in all of these polyketide assembly lines. For the uninitiated in you, in the lower left corner of this slide, and in all subsequent slides where I use these kinds of acronyms, I'll keep a key so that you can reference quickly what kind of enzyme or protein I'm talking about. And so when you see the letters KS in one of these modules, you know I am talking about a ketosynthase, 
and I'll introduce you to the enzymology of a ketosynthase in a moment. Similarly, when you see the letters AT, I'm talking about an acyl transferase. When you see the letter K, letters KR, I'm talking about a keto reductase, and so on and so forth. So in order to understand what module 3 does, what we're going to do is we're going to peel away everything else in the assembly line except for module 3. The ACP or the acyl carrier protein from the upstream module because that's the domain of the upstream module 2 that donates the polyketide chain into module 3. And the KS or ketosynthase from module 4 because that is the recipient of the product of module 3. And now we can look at the catalytic cycle associated with module 3. So we're going to start from the state of this module that is shown at 10 o'clock on this catalytic cycle, where you see that the module 3 itself is empty. It has no precursors bound to it. There is a, an, a, a substrate that is bound to the upstream acyl carrier protein, which is ready to come into module 3. And module 3, from its previous catalytic cycle, has donated its product to the next module, module 4. So starting from that point, the first chemical step that needs to occur is a translocation event. In this event, the growing polyketide chain, which was a triketide on the acyl carrier protein of the upstream module, has been moved into the module 3 and is now bound to the ketosynthase through what you might recognize as a thioester linkage. So the substrate was an acyl carrier protein bound thioester. And the product is also a thioester, but now it's bound in the underbelly of module 3 at the ketosynthase active site. That reaction from here on out we're going to talk about as a translocation event because the chain has been translocated from one module to the next. The next event in the catalytic cycle is an acyl transfer event. This is when module 3 makes a critical choice about what precursor it is going to pick from the cell soup from the metabolic pool of precursors that exists in the cell and bring it inside so it can catalyze a net set of operations. And this event we're going to call acyl transfer. It is catalyzed by the acyl transferase, or AT for short, and you'll see module 3 has one of those domains in it. And the acyl transferase of module 3 has picked a methyl malonyl extender unit from a coenzyme A bound precursor and transferred that methyl malonyl extender unit onto the ACP or acyl carrier protein of that module. So now we are at about 3 p.m. of this catalytic cycle you have an electrophilic growing polyketide chain attached as a thioester to the ketosynthase. You have a nucleophile, the methyl malonyl extender unit that is attached to the acyl carrier protein. And the stage is set up for the next reaction, which we're going to call the elongation reaction. This is where you see a carbon-carbon bond having formed between this three carbon unit and the rest of the chain that you see that came from the upstream module. So this reaction is the elongation step. And it is, for those of you who are considering the overall thermodynamics of the process, this is the key energy giving step in the process. From a thermodynamic perspective, it's this release of CO2 in the step that drives this 
overall enzymatic process forward. The next reaction that I call chain modification is a variable set of operations that this module does. In this particular case, all that the enzyme has done is it's catalyzed a racemization of the C2 carbon of the newly elongated polyketide chain. So the chain elongation step involved what is known as an inversion of stereochemistry, the 2S methylmalonyl extender unit stereochemistry got inverted, and you have the product that is formed. And in the modification step, the, that second carbon in the growing polyketide chain is scrambled to give you a racemic center. That step is catalyzed by the enzyme that I have designated in this module as a KR knot. Now, for those of you who are paying attention to the key I have in the lower left corner, you're wondering why did I call a racemase a keto reductase? That will become apparent to you as we go further in this lecture. Once the modification occurs, now you have both different flavors of stereochemistry available, and the chain is ready to move into the next module, which selectively chooses only one of those two diastereomers to process further, while the other one can be racemized again by that keto reductase-like racemase to give you additional precursors that can be moved forward. And so the take-home message from this slide is that a catalytic cycle of a polyketide assembly line module comprises of two translocation events, one from the upstream module, one to the downstream module, an acyl transfer that picks a building block, a chain elongation event, and a one or more modification events that leads to diversity generation on the growing polyketide chain. And now that you understand what module three does, it becomes relatively easy for you to see how each of the six modules of the 6-deoxyerythronolide B synthase perform a set of catalytic operations in each case on a methylmalonyl extender unit and a unique incoming polyketide chain to give you the product that comes out of this assembly line. Okay, so now that you understand the chemistry of this assembly line, let's talk a little bit about the structure. Now clearly, I'm showing you, you must recognize that even though I show you this assembly line in cartoon form as I showed you in this slide, this is not what the system looks like in nature. And many of you are probably already asking this question, what does this assembly line look like in three dimensions? So this is what we know today about the 6-deoxyerythronolide B. So on the top of this slide, I show you that same assembly line that I showed you earlier on with all those active sites labeled the same way but now what I have highlighted in green are the portions of the assembly line whose atomic structures have been solved primarily by X-ray crystallography, but also using NMR. What you can see over here is we know today the atomic structures of about a quarter to a third of this overall assembly line. These structures of the different pieces that I've highlighted in green-blue have, have been solved by first extracting these pieces out of the assembly line and then solving the structures of these assembly line, uh, of these pieces. What is important to recognize is that the Debs assembly line is, has a very strong repetitive characteristic. So 
different active sites occur again and again in the assembly line. What you will see is there is a ketosynthase, KS, that is associated with each of the six core modules of the assembly line, as is an acyl transferase, or AT, or an ACP. So what you have are domains that have homologs, and these are very homologous domains, so any two of the ketosynthases in the 6-deoxyerythronolide B synthase have upwards of 50% identity. And through this divide and conquer approach, one can therefore derive a fairly good insight into what the atomic structures of any of the individual domains within the assembly line are. So we have atomic structures of at least one prototypical domain of all of these uh, active sites that comprise the DEBS enzymatic assembly line. So that information, starting from that information, one can now start to build models for what an actual catalytic module might look like. This cartoon that I show you here is our best guess. So at the bottom of this cartoon, you're seeing in color the DNA arrangement of the domains that make up one of these modules that contains a ketosynthase, an acyl transferase, a ketoreductase, acyl carrier protein, and so on. And at the same time, what you're seeing on the top is a model for what this module might look like in three dimensions. Some aspects that you're seeing in this module, in this model, in this structural model, are hard facts because we have actual X-ray crystallographic structures or NMR structures of the pieces. But the relative orientations of these, so for example, the, the relative orientation of the pale blue part on the top and the lower uh, butterfly-like structure is somewhat speculative. And it's been derived primarily through models uh, that compare this polyketide synthase with the vertebrate fatty acid synthase that is a homologue of this module and whose structure has been solved. Now, how might one get additional data on what these modules might look like? This is where one uses lower resolution methods. In our case over here, we've used SACs to be able a small angle X-ray scattering. The graph that I show you to the left is a typical plot that one gets of scattering intensity against scattering angle. And from that data, one can get information about the size and shape of the protein that has been subjected to SACS analysis. And from that information about size and shape, one can derive lower resolution, but still useful models for what the module might look like. And what you're seeing in this slide suggests that the model I showed you in the earlier slide, which was derived from homology with the fatty acid synthase, isn't too far off base. You can use SACS also to look at larger pieces of the assembly line. So here we're looking at the, at at the SACS data, scattering data derived from a very large two-module protein that has a homodimeric molecular mass of on the order of 650 kilodaltons. Again, the key take-home message that you want to take from this slide is that there is a very defined three-dimensional architecture that one can predict for these assembly lines, or in this case, two adjacent modules of the assembly line. And if you put this kind of model building together, what you can get is insight into, or at least a, mo a, a, a model, a working model, for what the overall assembly line might look like. So what you're seeing in this cartoon is our best guess today of what the assembly line looks like. There's a module one denoted as M1, followed by a module two, and you're seeing a zigzag type of a structure 
that leads you, that gives you a sense of what this two million Dalton assembly line looks like. So I will stop over here. Hopefully this gives you a basic overview of what these assembly line polyketide synthases are, what chemistry they do, and what they look like, or at least our best guess today of what they look like. In subsequent modules, we'll talk about other aspects of these remarkable machines in nature. Thank you.